when we aim to be meaningful, we point out things to others, going, oh, look at this, or just look at that, sometimes adding a verbal description like, look at that old man with his street organ. Now, as we start, let us therefore consider the organ grinders of the olden days who roamed the streets, who would not only sing about ancient heroics, but also about blood-curdling crimes and monstrous murderers, and how in the end they would meet the fate they'd deserve. Sometimes the street musician would even uh, use a long stick to point at gruesome depictions of the crime and the punishment, like an early form of comic strip on a large hanging scroll. By pointing, we ascribe a certain role to an object or a figure within the framework of what we call a story. The camera is nothing but a sophisticated pointing device. Pointing here, pointing there, thus creating a roadmap in our minds, something we call a storyline. But beware, pointing is not as easy as you might think. Consider the following clip found on the internet that demonstrates very well how easy the eyes miss things that might be of importance. Watch closely. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Well, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Sorry, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. So, how did you do? Well, here's another thing. Look at that picture. What does it show? Hmm? Just a wall of bricks, is that right? Well, only the eagle-eyed amongst you will have discovered that there is actually a very prominent object at the center of this image. Hmm, you see it now? There is a large cigar sticking out of that wall. Even if you did not see it in the first place, once you've seen it, you cannot unsee it, can you? So why do I bother? Because film is the art of pointing at things in a meaningful way. And pointing is harder than you might have thought. Which leads us to an important question. So, what are movies about, in general? Hardly any movie eschews love and jealousy, things that connect people, things that make them foes. Conflict, struggle, trying hard to climb up the ladder of social status. All these things give a movie meaning. Why? And how? Because they are invisible. 
And that's exactly the reason why serious filmmaking is a religious art. The camera has to point at the invisible. But, dear Ip, how is that possible, you might ask? Well, let's see. Isn't all true art connecting us with the invisible? Sometimes through music and words, sometimes through the depiction of angels and demons, symbols and iconography, like in this wonderful picture of the Annunciation by Simone Martini. Let's consider this image of the planet Mars. According to a map of the planet's surface conceived by Italian astronomer Giovanni Scaparelli in 1877. There are structures visible that resemble long straight motorways of enormous dimensions, features that Scaparelli called canali, which has been translated into English as canals, and thus reinforced the idea that there probably is an advanced civilization at works on Mars. The author H. G. Wells picked up on that idea and wrote the classic science fiction novel War of the Worlds, which Orson Welles turned into a famous shocking radio play. But let's compare the old vision of Mars with a more recent one, an image captured by the Hubble Space Telescope. And what do you know? All the intriguing features are gone. How did that happen? And how is this of any importance to us as filmmakers? Well, aren't we storytellers doing the same thing that the Italian astronomer did? For when we tell stories, we dig canals into the brains of our listeners. Storylines are like magical motorways on an imaginary planet that connect the dots of plot points. Once we have learned how people see patterns where there really aren't any, we can make them follow any line of thought with passion. So where did those Mars channels come from? Here's a hypothesis. Look at this figure by a mathematician named Gaetano Canisa. It is designed to imply the form of a triangle where there is none. This image is highly suggestive and it is much more fun to look at than just a plain triangle. Isn't it? So may I suggest that we love to recognize patterns because we are trained by nature to do so. When you see a pattern, you get rewarded by a gush of bliss hormones. Imagine our caveman Ubungu eyeing some animal tracks on the ground while hearing some rustling in the underwood. Maybe even there's a scent in the air that altogether forms a pattern that says, there is a predator nearby. Recognizing patterns can save our lives and thus connects us emotionally with imaginary situations. I christened that effect an Alcatraz chick. Why Alcatraz chick? Well, just look at this funny picture that I found on the internet. It tells the story of a prison break from a chick's perspective. Yet the most important item is nowhere to be seen. The chick is in our heads only, and each of us creates their own ideal chick in their minds, thus surpassing what's even possible to put on film. While just the straight depiction of the chick takes away that part where the onlooker can contribute. The first picture tells a story by omitting the key item whereas the second one just illustrates something. And, sorry, that's boring. A very good example for that principle 
can be found in the classical epic Ben-Hur with Charlton Heston. There we can see Jesus Christ himself offering water to Ben-Hur. But can we see him? Actually, we only see him from behind. If you haven't seen that scene from Ben-Hur yet, pause the video and watch clip number one from the description below. So far, we've been talking about two essential art principles in general and visual arts in particular. Art is not nature. On the one hand, it is perceived in terms of the artist's intentions and how skillfully he performs his craft upon the raw material, be it wood, marble, or, in case of an actor or a dancer, his own body. On the other hand, art draws its meaningfulness from the realm of the invisible. To some, this might be just the kingdom of abstracts. To others, this might be the kingdom of God. Well, so be sure to tune in next time when we'll talk about dichotomies. See you around and God bless.